get started. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Global Environmental Change Bolin Lecture. My name is Julie Brigham Gretty. I'm uh, uh, Vice uh, President Elect of the section. And on behalf of myself and Phil Mott, who's in the room somewhere, um, who is the president, we're really um, happy to uh, provide this event for you today. Um, Bert Bolin's award is named after Bert Rickard Johannes Bolin, who is a Swedish uh, biogeochemist and meteorologist who served as the first chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They're meeting today and wrapping up in Madrid. Bolin was not only an outstanding researcher in the global uh, in biogeochemical cycles and climate change, but he was also an effective statesman, an international leader who brought together a range of views on, from thousands of scientists to inform the United Nations Convention on Climate Change and the Kyoto Protocol. His efforts directly contributed to a broad understanding of social, political, um, and security consequences of climate change, a lot of which we've talked about here at the meeting so far this week. The award recognizes groundbreaking research and leadership in, in global environmental change in cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary, and transdisciplinary research, particularly in the last five years. This year, we're very proud to give this award to Dr. Ruby Long of the uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in Richland, West Washington. She's a recognized leader in climate and hydrological sciences and has become a world leader in regional climate modeling and its applications. She has demonstrated exemplary community leadership, in particular in leading the regional climate initiative at NCAR in the early 2000s. And since 2016, she has been and is the first chief project scientist for the Department of Energy's Global Climate Modeling Project that has included leading the development of DOE's energy exascale climate system model that pushes the cutting edge to high resolution weather research and forecasting modeling with unique capabilities to represent human-Earth interactions. Ruby is an elected member of the National Academy of Engineering and Washington State Academy of Sciences. She's a fellow of the American Geophysical Union the American Meteorological Society, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. In 2017, she was named the Battelle Fellow for the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in recognition for her exceptional leadership and accomplishments in science. On behalf of the GEC section, please help me warmly welcome Ruby Long to the platform. for the kind introduction. So uh, this is a really great honor for me to be uh, receiving this award. Um, I didn't have the luck to know uh, Bert Bolin personally or interacted with him, but his um, scientific leadership and his ability to bring together diverse views on the <clears throat> Framework Convention on Climate Change is really admirable. So I hope that in a little way I have done a little bit in terms of bringing together diverse views to help us advance understanding and modeling of the Earth systems. So um, the title of my talk might be a little bit, um, sound a little strange to you and you may not know exactly what I am planning to talk about, but I hope that these graphics will tell you a lot more about what I'm going to talk about. So this is all about precipitation. Um, so, uh, of course, precipitation is generated by a lot of mesoscale processes, which is why I highlight the mesoscale processes as a bridge between weather and climate. So um, in my research, I have a lot of interest in looking at the water cycle. So the water cycle, of course, is not only precipitation. I have looked at um, snowpack, soil moisture, runoff, etc. cetera. Uh, particularly of interest to me is to understand how global change affects the water cycle. So uh, we know that global change can affect water cycles in many, many different ways. So the first way would actually be more indirect impacts um, of global change through warming. For example, through emissions of greenhouse gases, it can be from anthropogenic uh, emission of greenhouse gases, or it could be from uh, land use land cover change. So through emissions, then we know that the uh, temperature will warm up. Uh, this is what uh, climate models project into the future. So global warming is not just about temperature. 
So from climate models, we know that there is a pretty strong linear relationship between global warming and the precipitation change. So roughly this linear relationship tells us that for every degree of global warming, we expect roughly about 2% increase in the global mean temp uh, precipitation. So this is one way how global change can affect the water cycle. But of course, there are many other human activities that can also affect the water cycle. For example, land use land cover change can change the vegetation cover, therefore directly affecting the evapotranspiration. Um, impoundment uh, by the dams can directly affect the runoff in the rivers. And then irrigation can affect also evapotranspiration. So through impoundment, for example, as well as irrigation, then it can affect a lot of downstream uh, effects such as like flooding, drought, fish, etc. But of course, also uh, human activities such as um, in urbanization area that can also directly affect uh, precipitation and other aspects of the water cycle. So in my own research, um, I have looked at both of these types of problems, but today I have decided to focus a little bit more on global warming uh, and how that might be affecting uh, precipitation. So just to give you a little bit background, uh, at least to bring everyone uh, on the same page. So as I mentioned before, there is a strong linear relationship between global mean temperature and um, precipitation. So this is roughly drawn up over here. Um, so essentially the idea is that as the climate warm up, there is a linear relationship called the clausius clapeyron relationship, which dictates the relationship between the temperature and the saturation vapor pressure. And therefore, um, according to this nonlinear relationship, for every degree of warming, we expect the water vapor in the atmosphere to increase roughly by about 7%. So this is shown over here. But even though water vapor can increase by 7%, we do not see a 7% increase in the precipitation. Instead, we see mostly roughly about 2% increase in the precipitation for each degree of warming. And so to understand this, um, I'd like to call your attention to this uh, paper by Stevens and uh, Hu. Uh, so essentially, we understand that um, in order to precipitate, you also have uh, evapotranspiration. So on average, over long term, and also global average, precipitation is balanced by uh, evapotranspiration. But in order to produce evapotranspiration, you also need to involve the energy. So there's also a, a long-term energy balance. So roughly, the energy needed to evaporate comes mostly from radiation. And this radiation can roughly be written as a function of water vapor raised to the power B, and B is roughly less than 0.5. Therefore, as you plug these relationship into the two, rela the two formula, then you can see that for each uh, degree of warming, the change in the precipitation is related to the change in the water vapor by a factor of B, which is less than 0.5. Therefore, we do not expect the precipitation to increase as 7%, but it has to increase by less than 7%, roughly like 2 or 3% or so. And, and as a result, we can also imagine that if there is a 7% increase in the water vapor in the atmosphere, but only 2% increase in the precipitation. So the process that the upward motion that generate the condensation of the cloud and then precipitation, that upward motion must be slowing down because otherwise we would have um, a 7% increase. So the implication is that the circulation must slow down as a result of greenhouse uh, warming. So these are some of the things that we already know quite well in terms of global average. Okay, another aspect of uh, global precipitation is uh, extreme precipitation because we are interested not only in the global mean but also extreme. So uh, by now, we, uh, based on a lot of climate simulations as well as theories, we know that uh, water vapor increased by about 7% for each degree of warming. Global mean precipitation increases by just about 2%. But ex global mean extreme precipitation can increase by about 7%. And that is because when you talk about extreme precipitation, the fact that it is extreme means that it doesn't happen very often. And therefore, it doesn't really have to be constrained by the energy balance that we talk about. And, and as a matter of fact, when extre extreme precipitation happen, generally, 
it has a lot of vertical motion. And, and because of the release of the latent heating, the latent heating can actually make the vertical motion even stronger. And therefore, when you look at this uh, very nice plot produced by uh, NG Pendergrass, uh, we know that if you talk about the mean precipitation is about 2% for each degree of warming. But as you go to higher and higher percentile, like the 99.99 .99 percentile, we actually see a sometimes even larger than 7% increase in um, extreme precipitation. So this is really nice to know, but these are all about the global mean uh, precipitation and extreme precipitation. Uh, of course, we are much more interested in regional precipitation, right? Because, I mean, regional precipitation is what we experience and what would be affecting um, the, um, the environment that we live in. Uh, so these are figures coming from IPCC. So if you look at the spatial distribution of uh, precipitation mean as well as the extreme precipitation, which is shown over here by the 20-year return value, you see a lot of spatial variability. So to be able to explain and understand why there are these spatial variabilities actually takes us a lot of time and effort to really uh, be able to understand. Uh, so now I'm going to zoom into uh, North America. So if we look at North America, again, you see a large spatial variability too. So in the winter time, uh, models project like increases in precipitation and decreases in precipitation. And then in the summertime, there are also like different uh, spatial pattern of precipitation changes. But you can note that, for example, for winter time, there is this area, and then for the summertime, this area. These are the areas where the climate models, they don't actually agree on anything related to whether precipitation is going to increase or decrease. So particularly, this summertime precipitation change is really what motivated um, my, my team to really work on a little bit to try and understand why we really can tell whether precipitation is going to change in the central United States or how it's going to change. So as we know, uh, in the central United States, if you look at precipitation and where they are coming from, we know that about seven, uh, 30 to 70 percent of the warm season precipitation comes from these large uh, convection system we call mesoscale convective systems. So from now on, I'm going to just call it MCS. So it's really important for producing precipitation there. And if we look at uh, this study by Stevenson and Schumacher, where they look at what type of uh, precipitating system actually produce extreme precipitation in the central and the eastern United States, you can see that over summer time, uh, the majority of the extreme precipitation comes from these MCS system, suggesting that it's really important for us to know uh, these systems as well as for the models to be able to simulate these systems so that we can project how they might be changing in the future. So exactly what do we mean by mesoscale convective systems? So let's take a look at this very nice schematic uh, developed by Bob House. So essentially, a mesoscale convective system is really, really big. I mean, they are not like these type of individual uh, cumulus towers. So generally, when you think about um, cumulus towers, you think about these kind of convective cells may be of the order of less than 10 kilometers in terms of their spatial scale, and they usually only last a few hours. But for mesoscale convective systems, they can be like hundreds to thousands of uh, kilometers big in terms of their dimension, spatial dimension, and they can also they can last for like 10 to 24 hours, which is why they are producing a majority of the precipitation in that region. So also looking at the structure, it's quite interesting that in mesoscale convective systems, you have these like convective cores. The convective cores are not very big, usually also less than 10 kilometer wide. Uh, but they have this really huge area of what we call stratiform cloud or stratiform envelopes and covering large area because of the condensation uh, over here, it creates a very large heating profile that would be uh, very he heavy at the top part of, of the vertical profile. So in terms of the circulation, you see this kind of uh, mesoscale circulation up and down compared to like a typical kind of convective towers where these up updraft and downdraft are more just up and down vertical motion rather than with this kind of horizontal scale uh, type of mesoscale circulation. So the question is, I mean, why do we really need to care about this type of clouds except for the fact that they are producing a lot of precipitation? Are the characteristics of precipitation produced by MC and non-MCS, like these kind of convective clouds, very different. 
So let's take a look at here. So we have developed uh, methods to track these uh, MCSs based on uh, the outgoing long wave radiation that you can see from satellite, also based on precipitation feature. We can track them and then apply the tracking method to precipitation data set and therefore we can separate out precipitation that is associated with MCS or precipitation that is not associated with MCS. So let's take a look at how they might differ. So in terms of the diurnal cycle, you can see that non-MCS precipitation in the summertime typically peaks around late afternoon, like 6 p.m. But MCS precipitation, they typically peaks around midnight. So in terms of the diurnal cycle, they are already rather different. And let's take a look at the intensity as well. So uh, from this plot, you can see that MCS, they tend to produce more intense precipitation compared to non-MCS precipitation, partly because of the convective cores that is really strong and produce uh, this type of uh, intense precipitation. So it's important for us to separate them out because they do have different characteristics. You can also think about the intermittency of uh, uh, MCS and non-MCS precipitation in space and time. So based on the statistics that we calculated, MCS precipitation occur about 1.5 to two times less frequently in time compared to non-MCS precipitation. But in terms of space, they are produced like 2.5 to five times less frequently in space compared to non-MCS precipitation. So they don't happen very often and they, and, they don't, and they are not like occurring everywhere. So this intermittency is also a very important aspect when we think about the hydrological impacts of MCSs. So um, because of uh, the importance of MCSs, we have started looking at observation data to see whether uh, because of warming that have already happened in the past, can we actually see MCS whether they have changed or not. So based on the data set that we developed separating our precipitation associated with MCS versus non-MCS, we identified that in the last 35 years over the United States, we have already been seeing an increase in the extreme precipitation, the 95th percentile exceedance frequency of precipitation associated with MCS, mostly in the central United States and also in the Midwestern United States region. Not only that uh, MCSs have been producing more extreme precipitation in the past, but we found that the lifetime of MCSs have also been changing. So we see a linear trend of MCS increasing about 4% per decade in terms of the average lifetime of MCSs. But if you look at these higher percentile of MCS that, that are longer, life, longer lived MCSs, they have actually been increasing by 7% per decade in the last 35 years. So then uh, taking a look at why that might be the case based on observation. So we have done some analysis by compositing all the MCSs and then look at the large scale environment from reanalysis data. So what we found essentially if we look at the surface trend is that in the last 35 years in the United States, we have already experienced warming. But the warming is larger shown by the reddish color over here. The warming is larger over land compared to the ocean. And as a result, this change in the temperature gradient create a sea level pressure gradient as well. So because of the sea level pressure gradient, we have been seeing an increase in the southerly flow, bringing more moisture, partly also because of the warmer temperature. So this is really feeding more moisture to the central United States and therefore increasing uh, the extreme precipitation and the lifetime of MCSs. So now this really motivated us, like if MCSs have already been changing in the past, how might they change in the future? So this is really one important question that we have been asking. In order to do this, we rely a lot on climate models. But unfortunately, we don't think that the current generation of climate models are able to simulate MCSs. In fact, most of them cannot. The, uh, we have two hints of why they are not doing that. For example, if you look at the diurnal cycle of precipitation, this is based on observation, and then these color curves are based on different climate models. Uh, they mostly really do not capture this uh, uh, distinct feature of the diurnal cycle of precipitation associated with MCSs. Also in terms of precipitation intensity, we find that the models also are not producing the intense precipitation that is characteristics of MCSs as well. So based on these, we can kind of infer that 
uh, climate models aren't really simulating MCSs very, very well. And therefore, how are we able to use models to help us predict what might happen in the future? So the problem essentially about modeling MCS is I can think of it this way. So um, all kinds of convection, they are partly affected by the large scale circulation. So you can think about the large scale circulation affecting cloud microphysics and convection. But in a typical climate model, we are really parameterizing these processes. Particularly con for convection, we are pretty much assuming this called convective quasi equilibrium, uh, a population of vertical cumulus towers similar to what I showed you before with updraft and downdraft. And so these are really not representing the type of MCS that I already showed you before. And, and as a result, they will produce very different vertical heating profile, which fit back to the large scale circulation differently. So this is essentially a fundamental problem of parameterization is that we are not really ca capturing the specific structure of the MCSs that would be producing the precipitation like the intense precipitation, as well as feeding back to the large scale circulation. So what might we be able to do in order to kind of like look at how uh, global change may be affecting MCSs in the future? I think there are three different modeling approaches that are computationally feasible now that we can use to run climate simulations for seasons and decades. So one approach is using this limited area model. You can just apply high resolution to a specific region. You can also use this global variable resolution model where you only do high resolution over a specific area in the context of a global model. And you can, of course, also do, for example, a multi-scale modeling framework where you can embed a cloud resolving model within each uh, global climate model grid cell. So that would also allow you to uh, better resolve the vertical motion uh, and, the, uh, and the convection inside. So I'm going to just give you a little bit of examples about these three different approaches and whether indeed we might be able to simulate MCSs using these approaches. So the first one is just an example where we use a regional climate model applied to the United States. So here we run the simulation at four kilometer resolution and we use the tracking method that we developed to track all the MCSs in the observation and also in the model simulation. And then we compile these statistics over here. So one is to look at the MCS lifetime, the distribution. And then the other one, look at the MCS event mean precipitation. And then also to look at the MCS equivalent diameter, thinking of it as kind of like a circle. So we see that the observation in blue and the model in red, the model is really able to capture these kind of characteristics of the uh, mesoscale convective system quite well at that kind of resolution. When we really turn off the convection parameterization and allowing the model to produce its own vertical motion. Another example is to use this global variable resolution model where we create a mesh of four kilometers over North America and then outside is 32 kilometer resolution. So we perform some simulations at four kilometer where we turn off convection scheme, but then at 12 and 25 kilometer, we still use a convective parameterization. So here we are comparing the MCS precipitation in springtime and in summertime. You can see that um, for the springtime, the three simulations at three different resolutions produce MCS precipitation rather well. But in the summertime, only the four kilometer simulation was able to produce some MCS precipitation, whereas the other two simulations completely miss all the MCSs, suggesting that, again, the parameterization of convection is probably problematic. But the question is also why summertime is so much worse than springtime. Uh, but uh, so take a look at another um, uh, approach that I talk about using this super parameterization. So here we use the uh, E3SM model, which is the Department of Energy's uh, Earth System model, including the cloud resolving model within embedded within each model grid cell. So here we are looking at springtime at the top and summertime in the bottom. And then, the, and then this column is for observation. This is the simulation including super parameterization. And then this is the simulation without super parameterization. We can see that the MCS precipitation produced by uh, the model with the super parameterization is indeed much better than the simulation that doesn't have the super parameterization. But again, springtime is much better in compared to the summertime, suggesting that there are some inherent uh, problem or challenges in modeling MCSs in the summertime. 
So now we take a look at why that might be the case. So we look at the large scale environment of springtime versus summertime when an MCS occur. So here we can see that in springtime, MCSs, they tend to form um, in the area where there is a synoptic system. So the synoptic system essentially provide a very strong vertical motion, the forcing for creating the MCSs. But for the summertime, oftentimes um, MCSs, they actually form in an environment. There is actually a high pressure system. So a high pressure system is not supposed to be favorable for convection. But in the parameter of the high pressure systems, there are these smaller scale perturbation that can still provide the vertical motion to create MCSs. And these are the kind of environment that, we, that the model particularly has a hard time in simulating. So we have a study where we uh, systematically do some analysis of this kind of environment using self-organizing map to really identify that in the springtime MCSs are more associated with synoptic systems, whereas summertime there's a, a bit more associated with smaller scale perturbation. Um, so a lot of the research has actually been advanced in, in the weather community. So the weather research has really led the way to understand for and forecast MCSs, and this is really allowing us to ask more climate relevant questions. So I'm just showing you figures over here, not meant for you to really know the detail, but just want to highlight this really a very nice um, a review paper uh, written by Bob House for the AMS Centennial monograph about MCSs. So in this monograph, he really uh, look at the development of the concepts about MCSs starting all the way from research in 1945, all the way to the research coming to here uh, uh, during this time. So based on these kind of understanding, I think we now have the basis to really ask questions that are more relevant for climate. And I'm going to give you some examples of questions that we have been asking, some we are beginning to address and some uh, we are only planning on addressing. So the first question I think is climate relevant is what are the impacts of MCSs on the large scale circulation? So this question actually was already asked um, a, a while back, but I think we are also trying to make some progress in that area. So first of all, um, in terms of the MCS impacts on the large scale circulation, we need to understand that MCSs are actually very ubiquitous. They don't happen only over North America. They actually happen in many other areas, particularly over the tropics. So in the global tropics, MCSs account for about 50 to 60% of the tropical rainfall. You can see the distribution. And they are also very important for this called Madden-Julian oscillation. So these Madden-Julian oscillation or MJO, you can see like super clusters of of MCSs forming in this kind of environment. So um, to address this question, so back in 2004, uh, Courtney Schumacher uh, produced a very nice paper. So identifying that um, the heating profile of MCSs, which is top heavy because there is a large stratiform area and the condensation releasing latent heating in that uh, stratiform area create this um, top heavy heating profile. And then the evaporation of raindrop at the, at the lower level create a cooling over there. So because of this heating profile, they ran some numerical experiments and they find that this kind of heating profile with diabetic heating at 400 hectopascal level can create stream function and force the large scale circulation because, they, because the heating is put at the upper troposphere, which is most effective in terms of driving the large scale circulation. Um, another study by uh, Guang Zhang, so he actually also looked at uh, the impacts of MC, uh, uh, MCSs, but particularly looking at whether MCS, uh, the MCS have anything to do with MJO. And so they find that uh, if they put in this kind of profile of the heating into their convective parameterization, then their model does a much better job. So here they are showing the evolution of MJO based on observation, based on their model simulation using their convection scheme. And then another set of simulation where they in, include this top heating profile. And you can see now the model is much better able to capture this evolution of the MJO, suggesting again that MCSs are really important for uh, the MJO propagation and, and the evolution. Another question that we have also begun to ask is to look at the role of MCSs in the global mass and energy transport. So this is a very nice figure produced by uh, Paul Louis uh, in his paper 2008, talking about this overturning circulation. In the tropics, you have like Hadley cell and Walker circulation, 
And then in the mid latitude, you have also overturning circulation associated with the synoptic systems, you know, eddies and storm tracks, etc. So here we use an approach uh, by looking at the isentrope. Essentially, look at so air with high entropy will rise, and then after that, then they cool down with low entropy. They will come down and 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 descend. So essentially, by tracking the um, isentrope, we are able to calculate the um, uh, the uh, the mass transport uh, associated with this kind of overturning circulation. So here, uh, led by our collaborator uh, uh, Sing Chao Chen, um, so together we look at. Uh, the two different reanalysis. One is the ELA interim reanalysis that has a resolution roughly about 80 kilometer, 80 kilometer, and then another reanalysis is the newer ELA5, which has a resolution roughly 30 kilometer. So then, calculating the mass transport the, of the overturning circulation, we find a difference between the two. So the mass transport is stronger in ELA5 that resolves more vertical motion. But the, but the difference between the two is mainly explained by mesoscale processes that have spatial scale less than 1,000 kilometer. In terms of the large scale overturning, there is not much difference between the two reanalysis data set. So these large scale overturning, of course, is mostly associated with synoptic system, associated with Hadley cell and the Walker cell. Whereas the mesoscale overturning are most likely associated with convective systems. So let's take a look at how the convective systems are being simulated in the ELA interim and the ELA5 um, data sets. So here we can take a look at the outgoing long wave radiation. When you see blue areas, these are the area with really deep convection. Uh, therefore, the um, Th therefore, the outgoing long wave radiation has a very low value. When you look at the uh, mass vertical upward mass transport at 175 hectopascal at the upper level uh, in the ELA interim data set versus the ELA5 data set, you can see a major difference between the two in that in the ELA5 reanalysis, you see mass transport even at the upper level at 175 hectopascal, and this is associated with area exactly where we see from observed outgoing long wave radiation with lots of strong convection. And these are also the area we know oftentimes there are MCSs occurring in this area, suggesting that MCSs likely play a really important role in terms of the transport of the mass as well as the overturning circulation and the, and the energy as well. Another question that we can ask is how may MCSs influence the mesoscale circulation and their own life cycle? So for this, we have uh, been doing some numerical experiments where we simulate MCSs. We kind of separate them into like short-lived MCS, medium-lived, and long-lived MCSs. We try to see like why some MCSs can last that long, like 10 to 24 hours or something like that. And so by compositing these MCSs of different lifetime, then we find that long-lived MCS, they have a really robust uh, heating profile that is indeed top-heavy. And because of the top-heavy heating profile, this vertical gradient of the heating profile provides a potential vorticity, or we call PV. So the PV will generate a mesoscale vortex, which then, based on the isentrope, it, it would cause an upward ascent of the air and therefore moistening of the, of the area that further feedback on lengthening the lifetime of the MCSs. Another question we ask, of course, is actually one of the major questions we ask motivating a lot of these work is how MCSs may respond to global warming. So I'd like to point you to some studies that have been uh, published by other groups. So this study uh, published by uh, Andre Prine um, at NCOR and his team, uh, so they use the Wolf model at four kilometer resolution and they simulate under current climate condition and future climate condition, compositing all the MCSs and how they might look like. And so what they found is essentially that in the current climate condition compared to the future, the MCSs are larger. They also produce more precipitation, particularly in the center area. So suggesting that there would be increased MCS rainfall volume under global warming. 
So based on this particular set of simulation, Christian Rasmussen has also been doing some very nice analysis looking at the thermodynamic environment and how they might change in order to produce this kind of changes. So essentially what she found is that in the future, the energy, which we call the convective available potential energy, so the energy you need, which is based on both the temperature, the heat, as well as the moisture, will increase in the future so that it, it can support stronger convection. But also what they found it as, at the same time, not only the KIP increases, but they also find that the convective inhibition also increased as well, suggesting that uh, the weaker convection would be suppressed because of the increase in the convective inhibition, and therefore more moisture can be trapped and retained in the boundary layer when there is sufficient KIP, then it would produce like much more rigorous or severe convection. So this is e exactly what they found in their simulation is that there will be fewer convection, but when it happens, it would be more uh, intense. So another study by uh, Ai Guodai put, uh, hypo produced a, a nice hypothesis to explain why that might be the case, like fewer convective cells, but when they happen, they become more intense. Uh, so essentially, the explanation is that um, when you have this kind of convection going on, you have vertical upward motion and it removes the moisture, produces precipitation. After that, the air becomes dry. You have like sinking motion and then evaporation continues to replenish the moisture and then enough moisture and then you kick it off again, another convective cell, et cetera, et cetera, in the current climate condition. But in the future climate condition, they suggest that um, when you have precipitation, it can increase by like, because these are extreme precipitation not constrained by the energy, so it can actually increase almost like the increase of 7% of the water vapor. And so you have like stronger convection, but then by removing all this moisture in the atmosphere, you have a dry atmosphere where evaporation also increases, but only at a much reduced rate of 2% per degree because of the constraint of the energy. And therefore, it takes much longer to replenish the atmosphere for another storm to come. And therefore, you will, have, you will see fewer storms, but when they happen, they will be more intense. So these studies are really talking about the thermodynamics environment of the MCS, how they might change in the future and therefore affect MCSs. But we think of uh, MCSs could also be affected by the dynamical environment as well. So when we think about the dynamical environment, one thing obviously that would be important is the uh, southerly flow that transport moisture to the central United States. And the southerly flow is partly associated with these uh, subtropical high pressure system we call the North Atlantic Subtropical High or the NASH system. So the subtropical high are essentially generated because of two mechanisms. One is land sea temperature contrast. So under global warming, we would expect land sea temperature contrast to increase and therefore the subtropical high will increase and transport more moisture. But at the same time, the subtropical high is also controlled by the Hadley circulation. So the Hadley cell create this downward motion over here, which contribute to the subtropical high. So our question is, how might the Hadley cell be changing in the future and affect the subtropical high as well? So we know that this ITCC, the tropical precipitation, kind of move around between wintertime and summertime. So from wintertime, it's more in the southern hemisphere, and by, by the time when the sun moves over to the northern hemisphere, then the ITCC also move over there. So based on a lot of climate model simulation, we find that under global warming, this migration of the ITCC from the colder hemisphere to the warmer hemisphere will be delayed, and therefore the monsoon precipitation will be delayed. And so this is essentially showing what we found in the model simulation. So to explain why that might be the case, so we know that um, under global warming, the atmosphere will become moister, and therefore um, in the springtime, when the temperature is warming up in the northern hemisphere, so northern hemisphere during spring, the temperature is increasing, has a strong tendency. But by the summertime, the tendency is already not very strong. So this tendency of the temperature has to be supported by latent heating. Under global warming, because the atmosphere is moister, and therefore to produce this te temperature tendency and heating up, you really need an increase in the latent heating, which is essentially proportional to the global mean temperature and the temperature tendency during the springtime. But what can provide this energy in order to, to heat up the atmosphere that become moister in the future? 
So based on simple energetics, you can imagine that in order to provide this extra latent heating for the, um, for the springtime, you really need to shift the IDCC to the southern hemisphere to provide this cross-equatorial energy flow that can supply the extra latent heating uh, for, for this temperature tendency. And because the IDCC will be staying in the southern hemisphere or the colder hemisphere a little bit longer in springtime and not moving quickly to the northern hemisphere, we can also expect that the Hadley circulation would be strengthening and the subtropical high would also be strengthening as well in springtime compared to the summertime. So what it is saying is that essentially based on this um, delay of the ITCC or the monsoon circulation and the changes in the subtropical high associated with the Hadley cell, we expect that the southerly flow that would be providing the moisture to the central United States would increase more in spring than summer. And this is exactly what we found based on global climate simulations. So showing the spring minus summer difference between the moisture transport and the precipitation. So we might expect that MCS may be increasing more strongly in the future during spring compared to summertime because of these kind of dynamical changes. So we can also ask another question about like how urbanization may be affecting convective storms. Of course, I mean, urbanization can affect the thermodynamic environment, which then we can expect could also affect convective storms. So here we have performed some numerical experiments using the Wolf model with an urban canopy model. And then we look at the propagation of MCS precipitation. We find that when we in include urbanization, particularly the land cover change, uh, the MCS precipitation will decrease. And then if we add not only the land cover change, but also the anthropogenic heat coming from the urban area, then this reduction in the MCS is even larger. So essentially what we are seeing is what we call urban dry island effect. So we often talk about urban heat island, but urban also is a dry island. So by changing the land cover, uh, reducing the vegetation cover, you reduce the evaporation. So this is part of the effect. But also by reducing the evaporation, you are heating up the surface, which then increase the sensible heat, as well as adding the anthropogenic heating in the um, urban area. So this really increase uh, the, uh, the heating within the boundary layer, raise the height of the boundary layer depth so that there is a dilution of the moisture within the PBL, which combined together are really causing this reduction in the MCS precipitation as a result of uh, urbanization. And now um, we can also ask another question. How do MCSs influence surface hydrology and land atmosphere interactions? But why would MCS be influencing them? One thing is, as I mentioned before, MCS precipitation is quite different from non-MCS precipitation, partly because of the difference in the diurnal cycle and partly because of the difference in the rain intens intensity. So we have used a technique we call water tacking. So essentially, think of it kind of like a putting a, a, a tracer. So we tack the uh, precipitation associated with MCS and non-MCS precipitation, put this tag into a land surface model. Then we can trace the water movement, how much of the MCS and non-MCS precipitation come back as evaporation, how much of it contribute to runoff, uh, soil moisture, etc., etc. So based on this experiment, we find indeed differences between MCS and non-MCS precipitation. So what we see is that uh, here we are showing you the non-MCS flux ratio, meaning like the ET, we are looking at ET, the soil moisture, at the runoff, and also the moisture, uh, soil moisture storage, uh, divided by the precipitation input from non-MCS precipitation and from MCS precipitation. So whenever you see something that is above the diagonal line, it means that the non-MCS is contributing more. So what we are seeing is that the non-MCS precipitation contribute more to evapotranspiration, whereas non-MCS precipitation, I mean, MCS precipitation contribute more to runoff, but non-MCS precipitation contributes more to evapotranspiration. And that is easy to understand because non-MCS precipitation is actually pretty light, at least lighter than, in terms of the intensity, lighter than MCS precipitation. Therefore, when you look at the soil moisture profile, Non-MCS precipitation tends to increase soil moisture only in the upper layers. 
whereas MCS precipitation tends to increase soil moisture much deeper through the soil column. And as a result, uh, these uh, increase in the soil moisture near the surface is more accessible by the plants to provide the evapotranspiration. So because of the difference in the evapotranspiration, we would also expect that MCS and non-MCS precipitation would have distinct characteristics in terms of the impacts on land atmosphere interactions. So now, uh, knowing all of these uh, questions that we can ask, um, there are now new modeling tools that we can use. There are also observation data set that we can use. Now I'm just going to introduce to you particularly these higher resolution model. I think that they are emerging. More modeling centers are really developing these models. So one such um, experiment is this called Diamond, which is an intercomparison of global cloud resolving model. So here they ran these cloud resolving model for 40 days compared to observation data provided by Himalari. And the fact is, you can hardly tell which one is the model simulation and which one is an observation, suggesting that they are really producing rather realistic features of precipitations and cloud. So um, our team in the development of the DOE Earth System Model called Energy Exascale Earth System Model, we are also currently developing our global cloud resolving model. We have two approaches of doing that. One I already show you using the super parameterization approach that allow us to really resolve convection. Another is the global cloud resolving model, which we have already developed the non hydrostatic uh, dynamical core, and we are adding the physics to this. So we are able to run these simulations on our big uh, DOE supercomputer, the biggest one now, uh, the fastest in the world, is the Summit machine, currently the application performance at 0.2 petaflops. And so we expect to have an exascale machine coming up online in about a year, where we will be able to do more of this type of cloud resolving simulations. So besides modeling, of course, we also need observations, right? So observation, recently there is a really nice field campaign, Ralampago cacti field campaign, uh, that happened over Argentina, where they collected a lot of data. Really, really great opportunity to use data sets to understand MCSs and to evaluate our models. So thank you to uh, Adam Vabo from PNL, uh, who is the PI of the Cacti Field Campaign, supported by DOE, and then Steve Nesbitt from UIUC, the PI of the Rodampago, supported by NSF. There are also other agencies involved as well. Um, besides a field campaign, of course, lots of observation coming from satellite, right? So we have trim satellite data, GPM satellite data, infrared satellite giving us uh, outgoing long wave radiation. We also have rain gauge data. So there have also been efforts combining these data sets to come up with a high resolution gridded data product. So this iMERGE data set at 0.1 degree resolution, 30 minute temporal resolution is a really useful data set and we have been doing our MCS tracking globally now using this kind of data set to really try and better understand the role of MCSs in the global circulation and in the global mass and energy transport. Uh, looking into the future, we really wanted to better understand the life cycle of MCSs. But if we rely on satellite that has a large inclination angle, they don't come back to visit the same area very often, so the sampling frequency is a bit problematic. So there has been a proposed um, uh, 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 campaign, not a campaign, but like a satellite design, where using low inclination, the orbit of the satellite never leaves the tropic. So with that, you can actually produce a, a track that sample the tropical region, the same region, over 10 times within a day. So within 24 hours, you can really sample the different parts of the MCS life cycle. I think this would be a really wonderful design because we have so much uncertainties in terms of understanding and modeling tropical convection. So a low inclination orbit would be a really ideal way to really address that. Another ongoing effort at NASA is this ACCP called Aerosource Cloud Convection and Precipitation Study. One of the goal is to really uh, use satellite to measure vertical motion. So vertical motion, of course, is important in understanding the life cycle of MCSs because then we can better understand the storm development and the life cycle and extreme precipitation, etc. So just finally summarizing. Um, so MCSs are really ubiquitous. I've shown you a satellite picture and we know that they occur in many, many places 
important over the tropics, but also important over the mid-latitude and extratropics in the summertime. So they have many impacts on not only weather, but also climate, uh, as well as the regional and global energy and water cycles. So weather research has already laid a very strong foundation in understanding and forecasting MCSs, enabling us to ask climate relevant questions. So we have begun to do that. Uh, future advances in observations and modeling will open more doors for MCS research in the coming decades. I think this is a great opportunity for us. Now we have a common currency between the weather community and the climate community. So in the past, if you ask a weather researcher, are you interested to look at our climate simulations? I'm sure that they will say no, because your climate simulations don't actually have storms. You don't really have MCS or con convective storms and things like that. Now we're beginning to be able to produce simulations that actually have storms. So now we have a common currency that we can look at. So I think this kind of collaboration using mesoscale processes such as MCS as a bridge between the weather and the climate community would help us really advance this kind of understanding and research in the future. So I thank you very much for your attention. Thanks. Okay, I, I invite you to uh, uh, come to the microphones. There's two in each corner here in the center of the room to ask your questions. And uh, while people are coming to the, uh, up to the microphones, let me ask you, I couldn't help but think of the farmers out west mm -hmm. um, and Iowa and the so what would you tell them about the next coming decades with these intense storms? We saw so much flooding. What, mm -hmm. what should they be doing? Is there a mechanism for taking what you're saying and talking to the farmers? Yeah, interesting question, because actually I was uh, interviewed by a reporter who write for the magazine, the John Deere magazine. <laughs> so they particularly, the magazine is particularly targeting farmers. And so indeed, farmers have been asking, like in the Midwest region, you know, in the central United States, this is really the breadbasket of the United States or even of the world. So it's important to understand how changes in precipitation might be affecting uh, agriculture. And so my message is that um, because a lot of the understanding that we have in terms of the future changes of MCS precipitation or even other types of precipitation comes from what we call the thermodynamics. So increasing temperature increases the moisture in the atmosphere, and that is a major factor. So I think we would expect precipitation to increase. But in terms of the magnitude, I think there is a lot more understanding that needs to happen because the dynamical changes, like the changes in the low-level jet, the, the subtropical high, Hadley circulation, those are a little bit more uncertain. So, but, but I think that we need to really send out the message that there is still a big part of the understanding that we are quite certain about. So before the next question, I'm sorry, I really wanted to acknowledge my collaborators and colleagues, and th which I forgot to, to roll down to. So I wanted to really acknowledge um, the US Department of Energy, uh, the Office of Science, Biological, and Environmental Research. So my funding, particularly for the MCS study, have been mostly supported by uh, the Regional and Global Modeling and Analysis Program, but uh, a lot, some of our modeling work is also be supported by the uh, energy, energy Exascale Earth System Model. I also wanted to uh, acknowledge my colleagues at PNNL, my collaborators, and also the big teams who are producing this um, global cloud resolving model and the super parameterization. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. And please introduce yourself uh, before you give your question. Hey, uh, my name is Chuck Hakarainen. I'm retired from the Electric Power Research Institute. Very interesting talk, Ruby. I think you made a strong case that mesoscale convective systems are a very significant contributor to precipitation, not only in the mid latitudes, but also in the tropics. And that may, and your, I'll call it offline work, shows that if there's going to be global warming significant, that that could lead to an increase in those. But I also heard you say that existing climate models do not simulate mm -hmm. MCS. But I also hear in the press people, cl global climate models are stating that their results show that global warming will lead to more precipitation and more extreme precipitation. Uh, is this a case of the right answer that they're getting for the wrong reasons? And if so, what will it take to uh, change the global climate model so that they get the right answer for the right reason? Yeah, so now this is a really good question. Yeah, thank you, Chuck. So um, yes, indeed, climate models, especially 
the current generation of global climate models that are typically like 100 to 200 kilometer resolution, they don't really produce MCSs. I would say most of them, if not all of them, they don't produce MCSs. But the fact that they also produce increase in precipitation, there is a good reason. Because even though climate models don't produce MCSs, they still have mechanisms to produce precipitation, either through stratiform clouds or through the typical um, strong uh, uh, cumulus towers. So by the thermodynamics, which we understand, uh, we, we can expect an increase in the precipitation and increase in the extreme precipitation. So as I mentioned, the uncertain part is really about how MCSs, because of the diabetic heating, which is really top heavy and affecting the global circulation. So, so how the global circulation will change and feedback on the MCSs, so that's the part that is uncertain. But the fact that climate models produce an increase in the precipitation, that does have a theoretical foundation to it. Yeah. Okay. Next. Uh, Bill Merrifield, <coughs> excuse me, from uh, Canadian Climate Modeling Center. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for the fascinating talk. Um, regarding the poor simulation of MCS over Central North America in summer, uh, how much of a role is played by uh, land surface biases and associated errors in uh, land atmosphere interactions such as evaporation? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, we, we believe that land atmosphere interactions probably play a role, particularly in summertime, uh, because of the fact that in the summertime, convection is not so strongly driven by these large scale systems like synoptic uh, system and things like that. And so any factors that would be affecting the thermodynamic environment would be important. And obviously the land surface by evaporation and things like that would be an important factor. So there have been some studies that suggest like for example, if you uh, include irrigation in your model, you might improve your simulation of MCSs. Or if you fix some of the model problems that might affect the simulation of evapotranspiration in your model, such as like representing groundwater or things like that, they might also help. Uh, suggesting that indeed, I think the land surface uh, play a role in, in the development of MCS, particularly in the summertime. Okay, over here. Hi, uh, Dan Feldman, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, mm -hmm. You presented some observational data from, from cacti and some, from satellites, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if there are other observational needs or gaps that uh, that uh, you can think of or you can see coming um, to to further the understanding of how MCSs will change um, in the coming decades. Yeah, observation data is indeed very important. Uh, so I mentioned about field campaign data. I think field campaign data has a very important role to play because you can measure a lot more variables um, at the same time. So you can fly through the clouds and things like that. So I think field campaign data will remain a very important part of the data set that we want to collect. But certainly satellite data is important. I mean, I mentioned about potentially these kind of low inclination orbit um, satellite could really sample the, the tropics much better uh, or measuring vertical velocity. We have never been able to measure vertical velocity before and that would really provide a drastically different capability for us to really look at convection. Uh, so these are the gaps uh, currently, but some discussion are already ongoing in terms of how we might do that. So I think participating in this kind of discussion um, would be really useful to, to see how um, uh, the community can be brought together to really, in a single voice, really think about what data sets do we need, what variables can we measure now, and, and really go deep dive into this problem and, and come up with a solution. Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see anyone else at the microphones, um, but if you do have additional questions, you could pl please come up um, after we uh, please help me give Ruby a fantastic, warm, well, uh, thank you for that lecture. <laughs>